Wow. Uh, full yeah. house. Excellent. Um, okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Policy Exchange. I'm Chris Yu. I head our digital government team uh, here, which means I look after all of our research on topics to do with technology, uh, data, and the internet. Um, and we are delighted to be hosting a session this afternoon talking about um, the future of digital government in the UK. Um, now, before I introduce the panel, I just wanted to say a few, uh, few words to set the scene. So, um, we've been very interested in this topic here at Policy Exchange. Um, we like to um, bring people together to exchange ideas and talk about the challenges facing policymakers. Um, and the way that technology and the web is evolving um, is having an enormous bearing on the way that we, uh, we run government and the way that we innovate. Um, and there's kind of two bits of context that I wanted to touch on. The first was about the way the internet um, is transforming our world and our society. Um, so you will all know as well as me that actually um, uh, now day to day we have ubiquitous or nearly ubiquitous uh, broadband. Many, many of us are carrying a smartphone. We have social networks and social media and so on. And it's completely changed the way that we do business and the way that we interact. Um, we'll do a quick um, straw poll to check who's awake. So um, hands up if in the last year um, you've walked into a travel agent on a high street to book a holiday. So that's 0%. Uh, and hands up if in the last year you've gone online to book a holiday. OK, so that's like 99 points something. Yeah, these, these, guys, these guys haven't had a holiday. <laughs> it's been, been busy on delivery. OK. Um, so, so it's changing our world. And it's, um, it's also, I think, changing the way that we, that we run organizations. So the whole philosophy of the internet about openness, um, agile ways of working, collaboration, um, gives us a chance to rethink um, the way that government and businesses work, rethink the boundaries of the state. Um, the second bit of context is to do with um, the world the government finds itself in. Um, we all know that there's tremendous pressure on the public finances. Um, we know that public sector productivity has been flat for a, um, the best part of a decade. Um, so we come under enormous pressure not just to um, cut costs, but to do um, better deliver better for citizens and to do it with um, uh, lower cost and, and less resource intensive. So um, that's the context. There are some big complications in this arena. Um, questions about the inertia in the public sector and how you um, start to turn the super tanker. What do we do about whether there's enough capability all the way through the public sector to deliver on uh, modernization? Um, and how do we change the way that we think about um, doing government business so that it's more focused on what the citizen needs and less focused on what is the easiest way through um, for the department. Now, all of that is a big deal. Um, it's something we're very interested in in policy exchange. Um, and we have a piece of work underway at the moment looking at um, all of these issues and trying to think through what are the challenges for policymakers um, as we stand here and look forward to 2015 and potentially all the way out to, to 2020. Um, and in the spirit of open policy making, we have a call for evidence um, up on our website at the moment. It'll be open for the next couple of weeks. So if you want to share your views with us, then please visit the Policy Exchange website, um, have a look at the questions, and send your thoughts, uh, thoughts in. Um, for today, I want to spend a bit of time focusing on um, where we are at the moment, what this government has achieved in the last couple of years. Um, and by all accounts, it's a pretty impressive, uh, impressive roster. Um, talk about where we are and some of the challenges um, for the next year or two. Um, and I am uh, delighted and honored to have a tremendous panel here to discuss, um, discuss all of this. Um, these will be familiar faces to many of you, but for those um, who haven't uh, met some of these people, um, on my left is Mike Bracken. Mike is Executive Director for Digital at the Cabinet Office, um, and amongst other things has been spearheading the Government Digital Service and the move to gov.uk, um, which O'Reilly Radar described as the default for how government should approach their online efforts in the 21st century. Um, and Gov.UK was recently nominated for the 2013 Design of the Year Awards. Um, I think it's pretty tough competition against the Shard and the uh, Olympic Cauldron and various other things. Um, but that's a tremendous achievement. Um, and Mike was formerly Director of Digital Development uh, at The Guardian. Um, and when I was doing my research for this session, I discovered, Mike, you were ranked 13th in the 2012 Wired 100, which was uh, excellent stuff. Um, on Mike's left is Liam Maxwell. Liam is Chief Technology Officer for Her Majesty's Government, um, formerly Executive Director for IT Reform at the Cabinet Office and Deputy Government CIO. Um, Liam was also a Counsel at the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead, Head of Computing at Eton, and has a background in uh, uh, IT profession. 
Um, and I think, Liam, you're famous for having uh, what is the user need um, marked on the back of your iPhone. I don't know if you've got it with you, but um, left it upstairs. Um, but uh, you know, that's a real reminder of um, how important this stuff is. Um, to my right, uh, Rohan Silva. Rohan is Senior Policy Advisor to uh, the Prime Minister. And Rohan, I know you've been a big champion of um, uh, the technology industry, Tech City, and you've done a lot of work with um, reforming the Enterprise Investment Scheme, um, the Entrepreneur Visa, and I know you're very interested in open government, um, crowdsourcing, and so on. Um, so we're thrilled to have you with us. Um, and I discovered you were ranked 11th in the 2012 <laughs> Wired 100. Um, so, um, so, you know, a li little bit of competition in government uh, went to us any harm. Um, and last but not least, uh, Tim Kelsey. Uh, Tim is National Director for Patients and Information at the NHS Commissioning Board, um, formerly Executive Director for Transparency and Open Data at the Cabinet Office, um, founder and CEO at Dr. Foster Intelligence, um, and a journalist who worked for a number of uh, papers and broadcasters. Um, so, delighted to have all of you with us. Um, the format for this session, um, I'm going to ask each of our panellists to um, say a few words, maybe no more than five minutes or so each, um, giving us their perspectives on what, uh, what they've achieved to date, where they think we are, and some of the challenges ahead. Um, and then I'll open us up for Q&A uh, from the floor, and we will aim to wrap up at around about half past three. Okay, um, and finally, um, if anyone is doing this on Twitter, the hashtag is uh, hash digital gov. It's probably quite a Twitter-friendly audience here. Okay, so um, that's enough from me. I think we'll hand over to um, Liam to kick us off. Is that okay? Or do you want to, you want to go first? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Well, thanks. Thanks, Chris. I mean, I, the, um, the fact that so many people are here today, I think, shows just how important this issue is, but I think also how widely understood it is that policy exchange is really at the forefront of thinking uh, in the think tank space in this area. You know, there's, there's such a siloed approach to policy, I think, in, in Whitehall, and technology in particular is in a sort of bucket over here, traditionally, and, uh, you know, the guys in the basement with the Red Dwarf t-shirts uh, sort of handling IT, and uh, we're doing the serious work of a government over here. And I think the way you're breaking down that barrier right here is, is truly a sight to, to behold. It's really, really fantastic. My first job was at the Treasury. I was a civil servant. Um, I think we overlapped. And on my very first day, I pointed out to some senior civil servants that the intranet at the Treasury had our phone numbers, Treasury phone numbers, but not any of the phone numbers for revenue and customs. And there was a huge amount of money and effort being spent trying to merge these departments, get them to work better. And so I naively on my first day said, well, look, I can, I'm, you know, I'm not an IT guy, I'm a policy person, but I'll, I'll go and get that fixed. And was told very generously by my by, uh, senior civil servant that that's not how you got ahead in this place, that that was for, for the IT people. And uh, so, you know, to be here with you, Chris, having hopefully <laughs> in some small way helped to change that culture, begun to change that culture in Whitehall is very wonderful. As a, as a government, I really think that what we're doing on digital is the most radical thing that most people haven't heard of. Our welfare reforms, our education reforms, our deficit reduction plan, rightly, broadly understood and recognized and contested. I think digital, though, interestingly, beyond you know, all of you in this room, not, not quite so well understood. And uh, that's why we thought it would be so helpful to, to get together for this session. As a government, we've set ourselves this ambition of <coughs> harnessing technology to stimulate entrepreneurship and innovation in the broader economy, and also to transform and improve the way that government works, to make government more efficient and more effective. I'm not going to talk too much about the digital economy side of things that uh, Chris briefly um, recapped around tech city and our tax policies and so on. But, um, uh, but I'm well aware, of course, that what these guys are doing on government digital policy does have an impact on growth. For example, opening up government IT procurement to SMEs, which is obviously urgently important, is, I believe, catalytic for economic growth. So there's clearly an interplay between these two worlds. But what I want to focus on, as, as is the topic, is the digital government side of things. And I think you could find people in the last administration that probably had, a, had very similar ambitions to harness technology to transform government. 
What I think is distinct about what we've done is to have a set of you know, philosophical, political values that I believe are in line with the spirit and architecture of the online age. And what, do I, what do I mean by that? I mean, that as a government, we, David Cameron, George Osborne, um, you know, truly believe in the uh, effervescent power of bottom-up innovation. They genuinely understand that a small group of people at the centre don't necessarily have all the value, have all the answers. They really believe that, and you can see, therefore, that approaches around open data, approaches around crowdsourcing, might therefore be attractive. We also believe, in the in the truest sense, that other people um, may well find better solutions than we can to problems. And again, our approach to IT, which I'll unpack in a second, I think reflects those philosophical values. So just as you know, we've set ourselves a task of trying to decentralize um, government, try to break up monolithic public services, you see that approach too in our IT uh, frameworks, which these guys have done such an amazing job of developing and executing. The, what, what all this adds up to, I think, is a very different approach to the last administration. So the, the example of the NHS IT supercomputer, I think, is often cited as proof of Whitehall's inability to uh, negotiate contracts, Whitehall's inability to uh, deliver and, uh, and oversee large-scale IT projects. And I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's part, of the, part of the problem with that, with that uh, project. I would say, though, at the core, there was a philosophical problem, which was the last government used technology to try and uh, gather ever more information and power decision-making to the centre. That's what the NHS supercomputer was about. There were no provisions in that project to, for example, give patients access to their own health records. That is something that we naturally, philosophically believe. And... I think it's also in line with the kind of open architecture, open standards, open source philosophy that's driving the internet revolution. So I think you can see how you know, our, our approach, decentralizing power, open information, I, I truly believe our, it stems from our philosophical values and is, happens to be, I think fortunately, consistent with the values of the internet revolution. There are four particular areas that I'm proudest of, and I think that we've made most headway on. And I'm not going to talk too much about each of them because you know, these guys are the, the real experts and the real heroes on this. The first is open data. And for me, the open data journey began in about 2006, quite un, in a quite unlikely way, when a uh, seven, yeah, I'm not going to say her age, actually, it'd be rude, but a, 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 a senior citizen, um, Baroness Noakes, in the House of Lords, sent me an email. And this email uh, referred to a young senator called Barack Obama, who together with another senator, Senator Coburn, had proposed a fiscal spending transparency bill of all items of federal government spending over $50,000. And this set me on a particular journey of exploration and work that led to us committing ourselves to uh, making spending data transparent. And then further down the line, I think sort of channeling uh, the sort of Hayekian impulses of parts of the Conservative Party, extending that logic, that approach to crime data, education data, transport data, and so on. And indeed, that's how I first met Liam, I think. Um, well, one of the first moments I engaged with Liam, Liam agreed to pilot, offered to pilot, spending transparency at Windsor Council. Uh, a lot of people in Whitehall were saying it would cost you know, a huge amount of money and be too, too difficult to make spending data transparent. And Liam proved in a matter of, I think, days in Windsor that this was absolutely possible. So he was our sort of implementation team even before we were in government, uh, which is uh, pretty remarkable. And I think on, on open data, first with Tom Steinberg, then with Tim Kelsey, now with a brilliant civil servant called Paul Maltby, you know, that open data, I think, is widely recognized as being the most advanced anywhere in the world. And the fact that Barack Obama has handed the chair of the Open Government Partnership to David Cameron this year 
is, I think, global recognition for that work. And obviously there's, there's more to do, but you know, we have a fantastic team of people and uh, uh, independent experts like uh, Rufus uh, Norris, Tim Berners-Lee, Stephen Shakespeare, all feeding into that work and transparency boards in every major department. You know, the, the logic of further open data is now inexorable. And what I think is wonderful about it is that the genie is truly out of the bottle. Nigel Lawson says the test of any policy is can the next lot easily reverse it? And I think with open data, you know, whatever the um, opposition's view to decentralization, giving away power, giving away information, I'm not sure they will um, U-turn and row back on that open data agenda. So I think that's, that's truly remarkable. Um, the second area that is informed by those values is crowdsourcing. And I think unbeknownst to many people, we've done a huge amount to try and open up policy making to the wisdom of the crowd. And you know, this, in a true sort of pop will eat itself moment, when we were in opposition, someone leaked to us, and this happens in Whitehall, someone leaked to us the then Labour government's IT strategy. And George Osborne, to his eternal you know, sort of credit, said, I know what we should do with it, rather than you know, um, you know, do the honest thing and uh, hand it back. Why don't we post it online and allow the crowd to critique it and pull it apart? Because it didn't look very good. We knew it wasn't very good. But let's let, let's let IT experts across the country uh, critique it and help, and that can inform our work. And ever since, we've done a huge amount. Two, two quick examples of crowdsourcing. One is the spending review that we undertook in 2010. The classic way, as Chris knows, that a spending review happens in government is a small group of treasury officials and ministers and advisors get in a room with a red pen and, and, uh, and go, to, go to work. We opened out the process to every single civil servant in the country. And we had literally tens of thousands of responses from civil servants about how money was being wasted, how efficiencies could be made. And within a matter of weeks, we were able to have an event like this with 200 civil servants that had posted ideas. And George Osborne was able to announce that 20 of these specific ideas were being acted on straight away. And so that kind of feedback loop was, was pretty remarkable. Um, similarly, on deregulation, we, we've run a process called the Red Tape Challenge, which is a pretty crap name, I, I, I admit it. But what it's about is saying, look, we in government need the help of business to identify the regulations that are a problem. So we went sector by sector by sector, marine, medicine, <coughs> you know, te technology, and so on. And when businesses complained about a specific regulation, the default setting was that that regulation would be scrapped unless the department responsible committed to reform that regulation or could publicly uh, justify why that regulation should stay as is. And it has led, again, literally to thousands of regulations being scrapped and thousands of regulations being committed to be reformed. And that wouldn't have happened without harnessing the wisdom of the crowd. We wouldn't, simply could not have known about some of these most egregious examples of frustration and regulatory in a, uh, uh, um, problems that, that, that were being caused. So that's the second area. If open data is the first, framed by our values to uh, give away information, the second is crowdsourcing. The third is driving down the cost of IT procurement. And uh, as, as many of you know, when we got into office, the public sector's IT spend in the UK was about 15 billion pounds. Um, and uh, is that right, broadly right? Yeah, central government's seven. Central government seven, <coughs> public sector broadly 15. That's far more per capita than any other country in the world. And we're, we're simply not, you know, by any means, getting our money's worth. Moore's law, which is at uh, every turn driving down the cost of computing, exists everywhere except in government. And you can sort of see why, right? I mean, the, the rough figures were something like 70% of government IT contracts when we got in uh, went to just seven companies. So, you know, domination by a oligopoly of providers. And um, this was inhibiting innovation and also mean that taxpayers were being, you know, royally screwed, to uh, use a technical term. And, uh, and we put in place 
you know, you set out in opposition a commitment to open standards, a level playing field for open source software, a cap on the overall size of government contracts. And what all of that we hoped would add up to is a much more modular approach to government IT, such that you de-risk projects by breaking them up into smaller elements, having much greater competitive intensity with more, more uh, companies bidding for the contracts in the first place. After all, there's only a handful of companies anywhere in the world that can bid for a five billion pound IT contract. So you're always gonna go back to the same suppliers again and again, very limited competitive tension in that kind of market. And I'm pleased to say that thanks to Liam, thanks to these guys and the people that work for them, I think that picture is really changing. And we've already taken billions out of government IT spend. And I'd be so bold as to say, we can, we can take the central government spend right down you know, by further billions. You know, and I think we can take as much out of IT spend over the course of this parliament from where we were in 2010 as is being projected in welfare reform and in lots of other areas. This really can make a very, very material difference, not just to um, the cost of governments, but also to the way that public services work. And that brings me on to the fourth and final of the areas that you know, I want to touch on as, as I think you know, the key achievements of this government in this space. And in truth, it's the area that I had thought least about in opposition on open data, crowdsourcing, the government IT procurement. I'd done a lot of work with these guys and others. But the fourth area is about digital transactions and about moving public services online. And there I think the sort of intellectual credit really should go to Martha Lane Fox and for setting out in a series of reports the opportunities um, for improving public services that came from moving digital transactions online. And what Mike has done with gov.uk and what he's going to do with the rest of government over the next few years is, is truly staggering. And, you know, in truth, the open data agenda, crowdsourcing, government IT procurement, you know, I, I, that stuff is catalytic. It has a dynamic impact in all kinds of ways. What Mike is doing has a very real, immediate impact, I think, to millions of people and the way they interact with government. It's phenomenally important. And, you know, we couldn't hope for a better team in Mike and in the amazing set of geeks he's got in his building in Hoburn the government digital service that really are you know the best in the world at what they do so those are the those are the four areas that i think have have been the most amazing achievements we can unpack more of those in the q a but i i hope what i've been able to communicate and convey is that you know we haven't arrived at those areas and our approach to them through a purely technocratic process this isn't just about the cost of government, although that is being brought down. It's not just about improving public services, although that is happening. It's, it's actually about, and I can say this because I'm the only political appointee on, on, on here, it's, it's really about being true to our philosophy as a government, giving away power, tackling the kind of information asymmetries that used to exist, and critically enabling the kind of bottom-up, effervescent, unpredictable innovation that comes from opening up contracts to small companies. It comes from opening up data to anyone who wants to use it. And I really think that, as I said at the outset, this is one of the most radical things that this government is doing. And I very much hope that, thanks to fantastic civil servants like this, it really will prove to be one of the most enduring and important things that my government achieves in however long it has in office. So, thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, so, who's going to go next? Um, yep. I, yeah, I'm sorry I've, I put it a little bit early, but I'm sure the conversation is fantastic. Um, I was going to tell you first of all a story which kind of takes us to the other end of this spectrum. I, I you know, had the privilege of working in central government with these guys. Uh, what, a, what a remarkable experience. But for the last six months or so, I've been leading the information technology agenda inside the NHS. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, I was with a group of absolutely inspirational people who have learning disabilities. Um, and we spent an afternoon just working through with them how we can, what we can do to make their lives better. You know, what can we do to make their interaction with the health service better? How can we help them look after themselves better at home and so on? And these are highly sophisticated people just with very significant disability. The carer of one of, the, uh, one of them who um, 
was uh, clearly in a state of distress during the course of the day. She, she was a nurse. She, she, she was not happy. She was clearly very exhausted. And it was very instantly, humanly obvious just the incredible sacrifice people make um, to be the carer of, of, a, of a daughter or son who, who has these disabilities. Um, and I sort of asked her, you know, what was the one thing I could do to just make a difference to her? And she said, the one thing you could do to make a difference to me is to just ask me once. Just ask me once. Every time I go into hospital, I don't want to have to repeat everything over and over again. This poor woman takes her daughter into numerous hospitals as she has emergencies on a pretty regular basis. And each time she goes into these hospitals, even ones that know her, as it were, they don't know her. They, she has to tell them over and over again who she is. And the, it's not so much the indignity and the simple inconvenience of that process. The real problem for her is that that means they don't know she's coming. And that means they haven't got the hoist ready by the bedside so they can lift her daughter out of, out of the wheelchair and so uh, effective you know, interventions can be made. And on average, she has to wait two hours every time she has an intervention, which can be more than once a day, for the hoist to bloody will turn up by the bedside and lift her daughter out of the, of the wheelchair. Now, that, that is a completely disgraceful situation. It's causing personal agony to somebody who is, well, God only knows the kind of torment that it's, it's creating for her child. And, this is because we don't have a digital health service. This, is, this could entirely be eradicated at one fell swoop if we had a health service that had, a, had digital records in place, was able to communicate even internally inside a hospital who people were, was able to just give people that thing they want, which in this case is, is tell it once. So I tell you that story because actually that's what this is about. This is, this is, of course it's about Whitehall and it's about, absolutely it's about winning ideological, uh, vital battles to put the, the citizen first, the customer first, but it's also about real lives in the field which we need to do something about right now. Um, the, the reason I'm saying that partly is of course today is an important day because today the government has made its response to the Francis report and in a way the NHS is in the middle of just a dozen different crises. You know, we have a fiscal crisis that's not going away. We've had the hunt for David Nicholson. By the way, I'm played by Sean Connery in that particular film. Um, we, have, um, we, have, we have this enormously correctly emotional catharsis around the extraordinary tragedy of what happened at Mid-Staffordshire Hospital. And today the government has made its response, and quite rightly, its response is all about transparency. It's all about participation. It's all about digital government. So I wasn't going to say enormous amounts about what we're, what we're currently doing in healthcare, but to direct you to a couple of documents, should you be interested, which lays out the programme. One is called Everyone Counts, um, which is an account of how we're going to be making, I think, a very radical transformation of the NHS through deployment of digital technologies. Um, and the other is the business plan, which, which will be published actually very shortly, has coming out, I think, tomorrow. Um, just, to, just a couple of things, though, that we, we are doing which are urgent. So one of the things is we, we currently have a, an opaqueness as I've indicated about the, 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 the NHS. We, we can't answer really important questions. In some cases, as in Mid Staffordshire, the absence of digital data means we can't save people's lives. I mean, at one extreme, it's that bad. But, but it's also about things like, right now, this minute, I couldn't tell you, nor could any doctor in this country, how many people were being treated with chemotherapy, nor at, with what outcome. I mean, literally, I couldn't count them. So, I mean, it's completely intolerable. It's intolerable on so many levels that that has to stop. So we've launched a very significant initiative, which we're calling Care.Data, to finally truly transform the data service of the NHS. And, and interestingly, I thought there would be, and there has been, you know, it's, it's a big cultural challenge. There's been some kind of, uh, not resistance so much as a need for us to sit down and properly explain our objectives, but, you know, the BMA has, has now come out being very favourably inclined towards a much greater availability of data. That is all about digital technologies, but it's really all about patient outcomes. So that's just one, one big example. And you'll see in June, for example, that we will be publishing for the first time anywhere in the world, um, definitely making uh, NHS England, the UK more broadly, world leader in open data in healthcare, um, individual consultant level data across 10 specialties in the NHS. So you'll be able to look up the, the, the outcomes data on your individual doctor, and now it, for hundreds of doctors from June, uh, in a way that no, no other patient can look up in other parts of, of the world. We're also going to be making transparency real for individual patients. So from March 2015, every patient, if they wish it, will be able to get online access to their GP records. 
Now, that's a sort of basic human right, which I think we can all agree with. But to be honest, the real reason we want people to have access to their GP records is to affect the digital transactional revolution that Mike has so pioneered in central government. We want people to book their appointments with GPs online. We want them to order online prescriptions. That'll all be happening. <coughs> and if you can imagine the agony we all suffer <coughs> just booking appointments with our GPs, the idea that we might be able to do that online is, is almost unimaginable, but that will happen during the course of the next two years. And by 2015, GPs who do not do that will find their contracts uh, in jeopardy. So these are really important, big moves. And then we've, we've had a couple of other things to point to. We've made commitments to now a paperless NHS by 2018, so a fully digital, interoperable service, exactly in a way the opposite of the supercomputer that Ro was referring to, the idea totally about setting standards and using interoperable means to deliver a open source, cost-effective, high-value, patient-led uh, digital infrastructure. Um, but it's also, oddly, uh, and I was just going to finish on this uh, point, um, so we talked about it being about outcomes for patients, which it absolutely is. We've talked about it being about the patient's experience, the hoist by the bed being there when you turn up. We've talked about it a little bit being about the, the sort of digital transformation being the precursor to a productive NHS. I haven't perhaps dwelt on that as much as I could, but hopefully you'll get the idea that in the midst of the biggest fiscal challenge in healthcare right across the world, this deployment of technology will be one of the most important strategies we have. But it's also about economic growth. And I, 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 I have the privilege of sitting, as, as does Liam, on the Genomics Strategy Board for the Prime Minister, which is being hosted by the uh, NHS Commissioning Board, which is really an attempt to try and uh, bring together the extraordinary data assets of the NHS, if we can unlock those with digital technology, to bear on the biggest medical breakthrough of our generation, which is the idea that we can transform medical science through the deployment of much of gene sequencing and understand how new interventions can be devised. And we are literally now, this minute, on the cusp of this revolution. Um, and, and if we can get the digital NHS to a point where it can start producing its data in safe, you know, um, anonymized ways to bear on the science of the moment, I think this will be one of the biggest economic stimuli we, we, we have. So there are so many reasons why we need to do it. Um, I hope that the NHS and more broadly health and care will be an exemplar of all the values you've just described, but that's, that's the journey we're on. Okay, excellent, Tim, thank you very much. So we've heard about the, um, the philosophy of digital government. We talked a bit about um, how this is playing out in healthcare. Uh, maybe if we go over to Liam and then Mike to talk about um, experience at uh, GDS and central government. I think about the week before I started and heard uh, Tom Loosemore explain in really clear terms where the future of digital was going in, in, in government. And I suppose just looking back at that time and um, if Chris asked me what's happened in the last year, describe it. I suppose I remember um, Ian Watmore who was um, brave enough to hire me and good man for him. Um, <laughs> once said to me that one of the things he wanted to do was to try and just turn around the, this super tanker of spending and just try and get it to stop for a moment before we work out what we need to do. And so part of what we've done, and this has been the, the first year of doing this, has been around rationalizing our procurement, rationalizing what we were doing. And, and I really do mean rationalizing as in making it rational because there have been, we had lots and lots of decisions that were based on the basis of just go ahead and buy it. We're big, we're government, we can go and do this. And this has been fueled by a market which is very large. We do measure the spend on IT in percentage of GDP, not in pounds, and that is a worry. Um, we spend 100 times more on IT than Estonia does, I think. And the thing is that we now live in a world where the technology is big enough that we can actually start to use that scale to our advantage. Um, so what have we done in, in the last sort of year and a half of getting this moving? Number one, we've moved to a more diverse market. We've introduced the cloud store, the G Cloud, and the whole point about that, and it's not perfect, but it's on the way. And that allows us to have a more diverse market and to engage with whoever is the best to provide services to government. Um, it's, it's a radical change in the way the procurements have run simply because of the way that it's diverse, but it's very, very important because it gives us a level playing field. Another thing, level playing field comes into the fact in terms of our policy on open standards. Um, we are the second government in the world to announce an open what an open standard is. 
And a lot of the people in this room, by the way, have helped us get to that decision. And thank you very much for your contributions to it. Uh, the first was Portugal, who knew? Um, but we have a, uh, we, they're great, but we have an open standard. And the whole point about that is that defines right at the core of our policy that we have um, interoperability. And that affects everything from police communications through to data interoperability through to medical records. Is the basis of what we're doing is on open standards. And that means we will be open about them. And that's where transparency has come in. We have looked at and we now have full sight on very large numbers of the contracts we get and the terms we are paying, which have never been looked at before. And that puts us in a competitive position. It also puts us in a position which, in boring procurement terms, means we can act as a crown, that we have one provider, or we are one customer, which has made purchasing much more effective. It means that we don't get rates for one company at a different rate across government. And these are easy ways of pulling out money from the system, the efficiencies we've been looking for. And so a lot of that has been about um, putting in a method of control. And the minister that we report to, Francis Maud, uh, has this phrase of tight loose. That we can keep the things that we need to keep tight, that is the control, the standards at the centre, and give people the ability to develop things um, and give people freedom to do things if they agree with those principles. And those are the principles behind the original IT strategy, and they're now the principles behind the future of technology in government. And so to give you a couple of views of what the future holds for us, the um, future holds more about identifying where the commodity services are in government, because there are lots of things we do across government where we are common. The fact I'm a policy worker, I work in the policy space, there are lots of other policy workers. The fact that I work in the cabinet office and someone else works in the home office is sweet and interesting, but it's like saying they work for Chelsea, they support Chelsea and I support Fulham. It's actually, we have the same user need, and this is bringing us back to the real focus here, is that a government which defines its technology according to the user need, that is, especially internally, is one which will deliver systems which work for people. My um, direct, my direct boss is Mike, but our, our boss up is um, uh, Stephen Kelly. And one of the things Stephen gets very upset about is that if he turns his computer on in the morning, it takes eight minutes to boot up. And we worked out quite early on that we spent 90 million pounds a year on civil servants waiting for their computers to boot up. Um, my computer doesn't do that. And it costs less than the one that was there. So the idea about building systems that actually are based around the user need is very important to us. And because it actually drives through that, gives us the dynamic behind the change that we want to deliver. So almost a sort of classic civil service, passive aggressive way of doing things that you define a principle and that principle actually drives through the change that you want to see. And the user need is one of the key parts of that because it is more sensible to use simpler technology. It is more simple to use a common platform across government for things like ERP, for desktop, for hosting. And get on with the technology side of life which is about mission IT, the IT side of life which is about mission IT. And that's where we're going to separate we think our lives now going forward, our focus is on delivering the commodity where commodity is due, and then actually specializing um, in the mission IT space, which will necessarily be done at the right size and the right shape for it, which is necessarily smaller than it was before. A key part of that is also harnessing the talent that we have across the civil service. And one of the things I suppose has, has often been an issue for us is we, we work with a bunch of tremendously talented people and part of the issue, and it's almost confessional that I have, is that we haven't made, and I haven't made enough use out of that. And that's sort of my resolution to walk out of here with, to say what are we doing in the future, is we have, much, we have a great amount of talent across the civil service which we can use and we haven't used effectively. And so capability is a core part of what we're looking to do um, in the future. But that sort of builds up to the idea, hopefully, that you can see that we've been taking through efficiencies, we've made big efficiencies, we've saved more than 400 million pounds this year in year, we've saved 300 million pounds already for next year. We are making these savings through delivering That's effective... The treasury baseline yeah. already features savings in IT. Yeah. So you're exceeding expectations yeah. very significantly. Yeah. Um, so, so, and so the, the idea is that we will, we, we've made the savings, we've made the efficiency. The really important thing now is actually the bigger savings are in the transformation. And that's what Mike's going to talk to you about, is about digital and the transformative nature of what we're doing. Right, right, thanks for that. That's a bit of a setup, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Um, I'll just give you a sort of an update of where we are. We're just off the transformation part of what we do. So the, the digital by default report, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, it's better, I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, really it boils down to four, four missions. The first was to create a government digital estate, a central government digital centre of excellence, and that's no mean feat in a federated system like ours, and we've pulled that together. It's in Hoban, but increasingly we're working in Swansea with DVLA, and we have a team up in, in Reading with DEFRA, and Glasgow with student loans, and lots of other places, because actually our, our, our service has to be distributed right across Whitehall. So uh, um, as much as a part of we focus here, it's about making sure that we've got the right skills in the right places. So that was really 2011 and pulling the government's digital service together. And the next key thing to do was to fix publishing. And it's not fixed right now, but many of you, I'm sure, will have used GovUK. We launched that, or we took the beta off the release in October last year, and that replaced Direct Government Business Link. And the major thing to do there is to make sure that user experience of government recognises a single user need, and which is that when people are using, want to deal with the government, they want to deal with the government not the department of this, that or the other that might have changed its name last week. So what we have to do is recognise the user need first and foremost. We have closed down or, or replaced and migrated hundreds of websites. I've not got the exact numbers today, but I think we started off with about 760. And the one thing you could say about all of those services was the only consistent thing about them was that they did not have a single consistent feature across any of them, <laughs> which actually is quite an achievement. The HTML is not that difficult. So, so we migrated those onto GovUK. Today we have 14 of our 24 major departments on that platform, and in the next year we'll get 300 plus agencies. We have about 30 today. So that means that day by day there's an accretion um, of all our services and we're making users' lives easier and better and all the indicators and all the data and evidence and metrics show that users are clearly getting a better deal, engagement is much higher, satisfaction is much higher and all that data is available on gov.uk forward slash performance. So that's a start with that and that ball is rolling and I think Rohan's point earlier about, you know, I, I can see a, a future government wanting to come back and roll back from that position but I can't quite see how they pay for it at the moment. So, um, you know, it's maybe one of those policies that, you know, becomes, has a life of its own. But we do that really to, to, to then get to the meat of the issue. And, and this is where we're actually we're at the heart of the policy debate. I'm not a policy um, person. I, I had a go once, I was rubbish at it. Um, someone in Whitehall talked to, like, like you would do a small child in the room, said in front of me, well, I was, oh, Mike, yeah, he met Mike, yeah, he's a delivery guy, I was like, oh, that's <laughs> smashing. Um, and that is actually, that comment is the heart of the problem because you know, this is a policy exchange event and we have a fundamental policy problem, which is there's 29,135 policy people around Whitehall right now and there's me and there's a bunch of people in Hoban trying to deliver their digital service back to them and our ratios are completely skewed. And what we've done over so much time is we've let go so much of our delivery capacity that it's a generational problem. When I was hired for this job, a civil service commissioner asked me that, you know, a really cutting edge question, you know, what job interviews are like, I said, why should we give you the job? I was like, that's a really good question actually. And the answer I gave was I'm 42, I was then 42, it's been a tough couple of years. And, um, and I said, the reason that is because I can just about talk to senior civil servants and perm sex. I can just about uh, be presentable to a Facebook developer as well and 25 year olds who we desperately need. And one of the things that we've done in government, where we, you know, about 97, where we, we put the internet stuff in the technology box and then we outsource the technology, was you've actually eviscerated a, a generation of people from, from our own organisations. And what we're trying to do right now is is fill that, fill that gap and bring people back in. So some of them, and Ro um, you know, referred to us as geeks before, and I'll, I'll take that, Sorry. but actually, no, it's okay. But the, the critical thing is actually, we are many cultures, and Chris talks about the, in, the culture of the internet. The internet, I don't believe, has a culture. It has a dominant culture at the moment, which is sort of a libertarian, West Coast-influenced culture, which we could talk about all day. But the point about the government digital services, it's the collaboration and creation of many different cultures. People who work for me are 30, people who've been in the civil service 35 years, alongside literally 17 year olds who decided not to go to university and come and work with us with digital skills. We've got data scientists, product managers, service managers, UX people, all manner of people in this, this sort of panoply of digital skills because actually not one technology or one 
one branch of the civil service is going to fix this problem. We need a small army of people, but inside the centre all working and collaborating. And that's, I think, the, the, the fundamental point about the policy challenge that we have in front of us. We cannot have this false distinction between policy people and delivery people. It is just going to get us nowhere. We've all got to be deliver digital people at the end of the day. So we're on the cusp of transformation. I've been working, we've been talking quite a while. So can I just say, has everyone seen the government digital strategy? Yeah, it's good, it's great. I've read nothing else since, I'm sure. And there are 18 responses to those that were published just before Christmas. And in those responses, they contain 25 of our major 50 services of transactions. Government has 672 transactions. The uh, most voluminous is um, stamp duty. Uh, and the least is a license to be buried at sea. That's it for the second. We're not in a rush to do that one. Bury someone. Bury someone, yes. Um, and yes, that's true. Thank you. And uh, we're taking 25 of the top 50 and trying to transform them in the next 400 days. And all the details are on the sort of GDS blog and the Cabinet Office website. But it's a huge, huge ask to try because what we're not doing, what we are doing is, as well as being digital transformations, these are transformations of public services. They just happen to be digital. And that is such a huge agenda. I do think, I agree with Roe, it has been somewhat understated with some of the other reforms going on. But if we get that right, they'll touch 99% of the people in this country and 99% of the businesses every day in going about their daily lives. Because the final point I'd like to make, it's pointed out to me in one of our policy debates was, I was asked about something I know nothing about, which happens every day, and I was asked about the, the West Coast thing in late last year, and said, well, you know, do you think it's damaged public confidence in policy and in, and in delivery? And I said, I don't see how it could really, or damage it further, because I think what damages our policy every day is people who have to phone a call centre five times to get an answer because the digital service isn't working, or they have multiple user needs and have to sign on for housing benefit with one service, and then, as Tim was saying, put the same data in and yet you know, another related service, and it's completely unnecessary. And for, you know, we know that in 910, that 150 million calls were made to central government contact centres, of which, uh, which were avoidable because our digital transactions just weren't able to be completed. This is crazy, and we've just got to solve that Sort, sort that problem out. So that's what we're intending to do over the next two years. We're going to need an army. You're all welcome to join in. Uh, and hopefully we'll be in a couple of years pointing at some of the great transformed public services. Excellent, Mike. Thank you very much. And then Liam as well. So um, um, I'm going to throw this open to um, questions and discussion with the audience. Um, I know, that Tim, you've got to go at three o'clock. So if, if there's a couple of questions for Tim, maybe we'll take those first and then we'll... Uh, and we'll widen it out. So, um, and there's a microphone in the room. So, if we could get the lady uh, in the turquoise scarf. And let's take two at a time, and then Tim can. Thanks. Hello, my name's Helen Goodman, and I'm a Labour member of Parliament. And actually, like Ren, the first time I used uh, the internet in a productive way was when I was in the Treasury, and that was to organise a strike because I realised <laughs> <laughs> the flat communication was really excellent for that. But. There's one thing that I'm really worried about in what you've been describing, and that is that you've left out the public. And we know that there are 10 million people who don't use the internet at the moment, and 16 million people without skills. And the irony is that these are precisely the people who most need the public services. And expecting all these people to be on online is going to give them a £5 weekly bill, uh, and they're having their incomes cut because of the welfare reforms, plus they've got to buy the kit. So uh, one of the big holes, and I know Policy Exchange has done a very good piece of work on this, but I really am... I cannot tell you how concerned I am about the lack of digital inclusion work that is going on at the moment. And I think particularly on universal credit, you are just heading for a car crash. Okay, so hold that's that. That's for Tim. That's for Tim, right. Hold, on, hold that thought and let's take a couple more questions for Tim before he has to leave. So the gentleman, um, <laughs> gentleman there and uh, one more. Just like... <laughs> uh, so Tristan Wilkerson, uh, I work for Martha now. Um, just changed jobs. Uh, so trying to address the um, issue that was, that was just raised. Um, I'm interested in mobility and location and how potentially disruptive or what sort of opportunities that presents. Okay, thank you. And then uh, one more, the gentleman uh, with his hand up in the blue uh, jumper. Hi, Sam Smith, Fivers International. My question is actually for Tim. Um, <laughs> and can you reply to our letter, please? Um, <laughs> David Cameron, at the end of yeah, last year... Yeah, we got it like two days ago, for all I can remember. 
There was anyway. a previous one as well. Um, <laughs> David Cameron at the end of 2012 talked about how medical data could be used to uh, get everybody to be a research patient and very clearly, as Rohan said, had an opt-out. What does a digital opt-out actually look like uh, following GDS principles? Okay. So just on inclusion, uh, so obviously in the, in the particular, so, well, it's not just particularly the health service, but in the health service, this issue of ensuring, you know, we are committed to providing a universal service for the point of living for all. So clearly if we want to engage people in making decisions which are digitally enabled, that has to be something that we, we work very hard on making accessible to everybody where they wish it to take place. So um, we, we've actually, it is in the public domain, but we've just launched a big initiative to take 100,000 people this year through basic kind of UK online type health literacy training. When we went out to some of the most disadvantaged communities, what we discovered was there was an enormous appetite to avail themselves of these emerging <coughs> digital opportunities. They just did not know how to, to engage. They didn't have the equipment. They didn't. So UK Online has done a, a very good job working, I think, with Martha and others to just build, you know, in some communities, better levels of digital literacy. And we're taking advantage of that in, 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 in health terms. But that's not also to deny the call to action that we've now made to the sort of third sector, the voluntary community more broadly, and to just the, the broader society to start helping us think through how we do make this you know, inclusion real. Um, it's, a really, it's a really complex conundrum, and as I say, talking to people with learning disabilities, actually amongst the most digitally literate people I've met, interestingly, um, the challenge varies so specifically from community to community, you know, homeless people are amongst the most digitally literate people we know. Um, it, it's just a very complex but real issue. So just to give you a sense that it's absolutely full and full square central to the way we're thinking about, about rolling out this digital future in healthcare. Others may have something to say that, about that more broadly. Just on Sam's specific question, um, I'm going to answer this kind of a roundabout way because the law's really explicit on things like opt-outs and objections, and we can talk about those until the cows come home. But I, I've said this to you personally. I'll say it again. I am completely committed, A, to the NHS acting in, in not just the, to the letter of the law, but to the spirit of the law. And the spirit of the law is quite clear. The spirit of the law is that identifiable patient data should only be shared with the patient's consent, or where there is, a, there is an overarching and legal exemption for that not to be the case. Um, we, that, that, the nature of that legal exemption is being hugely tightened up. One of the good things about the current reforms is that it's now more transparent and more explicit than ever as to what the process is for the handling of identifiable data, whether where somebody is unconscious or not capable of giving their consent. But you, be assured that from this point, point onwards, as the, as the service transitions on April into, as it were, the new NHS, that there will be a clarity around information governance, which has not been there before. This should provide you and others with real reassurance. Um, and I, all I can say is I'm completely committed to being, you know, the purest policeman of that responsibility. So that's... Okay, excellent. Tim, thank you very much. No, and thank you. We'll let you get to your next Cheers. engagement. Thanks. Thanks for joining thank us. Thank you. Mike, did you want to touch on the digital inclusion point that yeah, was well, raised? Yeah, I, I can do. I think it's a very good point. I think, Roger, you're right. I think oh, yes, government sorry. so far has been distributed and too fragmented in its answers to these questions. Many of the answers are actually service-specific, um, so that we have to have specific intermediaries and third parties and also parts of local uh, central government provision for the service. You know, an, an intermediary for one service isn't necessarily the right intermediary for another service. And, um, we'll find that, well, Tim would say, in health uh, and in other large parts of the estate. But what you'll see in the next uh, short time is the assisted digital strategy that we've been working on very hard to try and bring a lot of that together and also work on digital inclusion. So um, I'm quite happy to talk to you sort of in, as an MP, if you like, or independently later on. But we are aware, and that's the biggest single priority that I've got to bring those two strategies yeah. to, to bear. But the major point is, is, is that we have got to create digital services so attractive and so useful that people want to use them. Generally, Pareto law works in digital services. If you can get to 20%, you can get to 80 And um, it's bound to get to 85% of users that it starts to break down into people who can't or people who won't use services for a variety of different reasons, actually bewildering, bewildering variety in some cases. And we've got to get an appropriate level of service provision first and also intermediaries who can help us, often at local and regional level as well. And at Cabinet Office, we're trying to pull some of that together right now. Yeah, I think, I think while there's been a big 
shift, I think, in the approach of this government versus the last government on all this digital agenda. One area of commonality, which um, is, is the approach on digital inclusion. And you know, the fact that Martha Lane Fox you know, fed into the last government's work on digital inclusion and continues to feed into ours, people like Tristan helping her, um, I think is, is a, an indication of that. So you know, there's ongoing investment, as under the last government, on uh, digital inclusions and digital skills. We've created 9,000 pound bursaries for, uh, t for graduates of uh, computer science to become computer science teachers. We've uh, created things like uh, digital apprenticeships and, and specific tech city apprenticeships to get young people in Hackney and Tower Hamlets and Bethnal Green engaged and uh, equipped with the digital skills they need. So I entirely agree with you. And you're so right that it's such an important agenda. As Mike says, getting digital services that for the first time really are frictionless and easy to use online is a big step. And then for that final 10, 15, 20%, you know, it's a real full press approach, and um, you know you're right to raise it, and I think I think we're right to continue to really focus on it. But we should add also, it's it's very important that we don't focus on or use those communities and those people with difficulties of whatever type to justify not serving the mainstream users. Because, being really frank, one of the things I've found in government is one of the internal resistances or you know it's the it's the it's the long tail it's the it's the extreme user cases people say well we wouldn't reform this service because there might be some people who wouldn't be able to use or wouldn't have the skills to use what you reform it with and it's too often that's not giving the service to the mainstream user yeah, as well I mean, obviously you know applying for the TVLA, that's like a mainstream public service that everybody sure. should use sure. whereas you know when you're talking about benefits you've got a much bigger overlap and that's yeah. of course overlap. So, for instance, one of the things we're doing right now is working with DWP on carers allowance and learning a lot about the people who are doing that and actually providing them with services. But one of the interesting things is that the actual volume of those, service, those services are not actually that high. There's clearly a lot of detail and specificity within that. And by allowing us to work with those, getting in there early and working with those people, you can tailor the services very, very quickly and make changes as they use them because actually many of our services well, because we have 672, many of them, the user flows of them, the actual numbers of people who use them are not that great. So if you can get in there early and change stuff on bit based on what users are telling you, there's a high likelihood that the number of people who feel that they're not able to use them is much smaller. Okay. Um, I know a lot of people want to ask questions, so I'll take another um, three maybe. Um, let's start with Hadley, who's right next to the microphone. I'm Hadley Beeman, and I'm particularly interested in the connection or sort of interplay between the tech industry and government. I seem to spend my life with one foot in each. Um, but I wanted to ask the panel, do you see that relationship as being functional and optimal, are the things we need to do to improve it? Um, I say Mike is grinning. Specifically, um, my focus is as the chair of a W3C working group. I very much appreciate the participation of, of some people from across the civil service, but we would desperately love to have the participation of more in trying to build web standards that ultimately, among other things, benefit uh, our government. How can we make this better? Okay, thanks for that. And then let's take a couple more questions. So who else had the hand up? Um, lady over there by the window, can you pass the mic along? Thank you. Hello, Emma Carr from Big Brother Watch. Um, I wanted to ask you a quick question about the communications data bill. Uh, a YouGov poll showed that 40% of people would be unlikely to use online public services if the bill was passed. And you've talked a lot about things like Tech City, and Jimmy Wells has said that uh, if this bill is passed, it's going to make the UK an incredibly unattractive place to bring tech startups. So I'd like the panel to answer uh, honestly <laughs> whether you think there's a disparity between uh, the digital agenda and uh, some other pieces of the government's policy. Okay, thank you. And uh, the gentleman at the back standing up. Hi, uh, I'm Anthony Zakrzewski from the Democratic Society, and I'd just like the panel to share the most instructive mistake that they made in their current jobs. <laughs> <laughs> what a, what a good question. I hope. Okay, so um, question about um, what's the relationship like with the uh, technology industry and how do we improve that? Um, point around the comms data bill and uh, your most instructive mistake. So who would like to, to kick us off, Liam? Just, just on the industry and the engagement, we are having a, we are moving from a, a position where we were really, as a government, dealing with 12 large suppliers, as, as, which was described by PASC as, as an oligopoly, um, to a more diverse marketplace. And that means dealing with smaller businesses. And so one of the um, 
prime things that we've done in this year is actually had an engagement with, two, we had 250 small businesses we engaged with very early on this year who we're trying to prime to join um, a procurement framework and that will help us deliver um, more business to smaller businesses, uh, which actually suits us because um, we find we get a better price uh, it suits the economic growth argument as well, but it also suits our more agile approach to um, procurement. So we, we have that. It is, a, it is a changing market, and it's one of the really interesting points is it is a changing market at this point. And um, so our relationship with industry as a buyer has been one now where we are very much a, um, a much more informed buyer who is able to take competitive decisions. I'm often sort of pasted as being an open source junkie or an SME junkie. I'm not. I'm a competition junkie. And that's the key part of what we're doing is we're trying to increase competition and that means giving more of the business that we do with a wider range of, necessarily with a wider range of um, providers because we have a level playing field for procurement uh, in space. Uh, the other thing with, um, uh, just in terms of small businesses, so one of the great things we've talked about is there are now clusters of businesses such as Tech City, there are six main clusters around the UK which are generating jobs and they're generating growth and they're generating tax and national insurance, which is the thing that we live on. Um, and so we found that very important indeed. Um, and that's one of those, um, you know, we're, we're very heartened by the fact that we can do that. And as we look to other countries in the comparison to us, I was recently in the um, summit in Riga and it was one of the key points that was pointed out. There's a really good tech industry in Estonia, which is growing, but there are, um, our tech industry is one of the best places to invest in the world at the moment and we want to make it um, much easier to do so for people. We also need to just add on to that part of the conundrum that you've asked us about is the actual definition of terms because what's a tech industry and for so and for so long that we've actually constrained or I don't know who that is but it's for so long we've we've actually focused on a very small or a powerful but small subset of that mm -hmm. and we think in government as a tech industry with engagement models with sometimes lobbying groups or small small uh, organizations who present themselves ostensibly as an industry but actually are a, a, a big but a powerful but not nonetheless a subset of that and it's hard you know the work that Rose done in Tech City and around around the country. It's it's hard to engage with some of those companies, particularly those SMEs, because they've you know they haven't got the bandwidth for government. So we've got to make that as frictionless as possible. But I do think avoiding some of those elephant traps and not talking to organisations as if they are the tech industry is a good place to start. Yeah. No. Just just very briefly on that. When we were uh, in opposition, I'd written a speech on called open source politics that George Osborne was going to give and it set out amongst other things our commitment to crowdsourcing and open standards in in uh, government IT and open source software and backbench Tory MPs were calling us up this was the day day before the speech was being given saying that a major global IT company with R&D facilities in their constituencies was saying to them if the speech was given as drafted those R&D facilities would disappear and George, to his kind of eternal credit, said, sod them. We're, we're, I, mean, not, I mean, that company, um, they can come and talk to us directly if they've got a problem. And the company never did. It was this sort of round-the-back, very aggressive lobbying. And as, but as Mike says, you know, I think one of the things that you know, I'm really pleased about, five things like Tech City, is there have been various, you know, just every, every week there's a different minister in East London and they're talking to real SMEs, real tech entrepreneurs that are generally too busy working on their own business and they don't have public affairs people. And that's why we've had the Entrepreneur Visa, the most generous tax breaks in the world for angel investment, opening up the London Stock Exchange, the growth firms, the Hargreaves Review of Intellectual Property, all of this stuff. There's never been a government, I think, that's placed more emphasis on high growth tech firms. And it's because those conversations are happening. On, on the... Um, uh, communications bill, and I'm sure others will have, have some points on this, um, and it, it, it speaks to Hadley's point. My, my approach has been, and I, I hope this is right, to make sure that the people working on, on that legislation, the Home Office and in the intelligence agencies and, and so on, are connected with the best private sector or non-governmental IT advice possible. For example, I brought Jimmy Wells in at multiple times to speak to 
um, relevant people and other IT folk too. Because as exactly as Mike says, you can quite easily and understandably think, oh, I've spoken to the IT people, this big company says it's okay. But you, you're not necessarily getting the best, most cutting edge uh, sort of expertise. So that's been the approach to kind of inform government's thinking by presenting them with and putting them and putting people in a room with brilliant cutting edge IT people like like Jimmy. On um, on on the biggest mistake, um, I don't know if it's the biggest, but I, um, I mentioned in my in my little preamble that we opened up the um, spending review process to civil servants and it went really well. Buoyed by that, we then opened out the crowdsourcing to the entire public on mm -hmm. the spending review. And we used, um, I think we used Facebook for it. So we used quite an open platform in a very open way. And frankly, it was a disaster. Um, not that Facebook's not brilliant, but it, it, we just got bombarded with frank, you know, racist poems, um, abuse, um, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. And our learning from that has been to try and better frame the question and to try and use platforms that are appropriate for the question at hand. And when, when something is as understandably as you know, politically contested and, uh, and, and difficult as what we believe is you know, the necessary job of reducing the cost of government, you're going to have um, friction. And there's always going to be a small group of people that are, working, that are keen to take it down. And uh, David Miliband, I think, discovered that with his uh, wiki in opposition that was demolished within, I think, seconds by, by uh, um, activists. So I'd say that was my, maybe not the biggest mistake, but certainly a mistake that's very relevant to this, this conversation. Okay, thank you. Any other instructive mistakes you'd like to share? Can I also just on the uh, CCD bill? Yeah, of course. Um, Christina, I'm very happy to talk to you a bit more about it because it's a very detailed subject. It is one of those, um, I suppose, and, and I'm not trying to get out before I answer your question, but the, the questions that we've been asking around that, because that does actually come through, um, our purview is one, is it proportionate? Two, is it fair? Three, is it invasive? And truly invasive in what it's looking at? And those are things which we can inform um, and help the... Um, our, our political masters with. Um, on most of those, um, and in fact on all of those, I can say that it has been moving very strongly in the right direction, um, though I don't think it meets the, um, uh, it's never going to meet some of the uh, needs of some people, and there is more room where we could move on it. One of the things, just to give you a sort of chink of light into some of the ways that it's one of those classic situations where a department really wanted to get something through, and we made sure that in that process, in that competitive area, we put in place a market for the providers for it, who were, it's got a very strong small business bias to help people move that through, which I know isn't gonna help your particular political or um, Big Brother Watch view on it, but that is one of the key things we've done with that area, is make it a more uh, small business focused um, program. So um, that's, that's one area, but in terms of the actual invasiveness of it, it is in a much better place than it was. I have to say, and it is a very far cry, as some people might say, from the Interceptor Modernization Program, which was the beer moth beforehand, which uh, took an enormous amount of, and would have taken an enormous amount more control away from the citizen at that point. Uh, in terms of um, constructive mistakes or something, I suppose my, I would say in, in policy terms, the, the biggest mistake that we didn't do in the space I was in was we weren't <coughs> strong enough about open data and um, public sector information being freely available or at marginal cost. I think that's one of the things which we've missed and I would really uh, like to and we are continually backtracking against that. Um, we are seen on, on trading funds? Yeah. So we are seen by the rest of Europe and one of the interesting calls we get is we're seen by the rest of Europe as the leaders in open data. And so when we did the um, Prime Minister Summit in, um, in Latvia, the Estonian Prime Minister amazingly came to us and said, oh, we really want to use your technology. There's a great export market for what we've done, for the things we've done in open data. People really like what we've done and the way that we have done it. But we need to make more of an effort in making public sector data and information more readily available because it is readily apparent to us that we will generate more tax and national insurance by freeing that market up and allowing companies to grow using it than by extracting a levy as it goes out the door. Okay. Anything to add on constructive mistakes, Mike? Not getting a bigger office. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Okay, let's take a few more questions uh, from the room. So, uh, 
at the front. Hi, Liz Cantor from BlackBerry. I just wanted to ask another question on the open data point. When it, you've obviously talked about it being very successful. One of the drivers of it, of course, is for SMEs to use the data for their own businesses and developing apps and that mm. kind of thing. Yeah. I just wonder, actually, how successful has that take-up been? Mm. And if it hasn't been, what else can be done yeah. to see more app creation through that data? Okay, so hold that and let's take a couple more. So, um, gentleman um, by the wall had his hand up. Thank you very much, Alex Perkis from EMC and the Pivotal Initiative. Um, sort of building on what we've just heard as well. And we've talked a lot about SMEs and uh, open data. Quick question to all of you, but do you see the day, we've characterized the SME problem as a procurement problem, but do you see the day when government will publish its APIs to enable read-write activity in the way that companies like BP and French banks are now doing? Okay, great question. And then one more, the lady in the uh, red top. Oh, no, what's that one? That's that. Hi, I'm Kathleen Hall from Computer Weekly. Um, I was interested in the uh, invocation of large government IT projects gone wrong that uh, Rohan was discussing. Um, following from that point, I'd be interested in the panel's view on how universal credit fits in with the new model of IT, given the fact that it's a mammoth project, it's concentrated in the hands of a few suppliers, and there's now mounting concerns being raised over its de deliverability. Okay, thank you. So a question about... Um uh, the future of open data. Um, a question about um, SMEs and will government ever open up its uh, APIs and um, something about uh, large IT programs and so universal credit. We could so probably get one, two, three on those. So if yeah. I, I'll just take those as um, on, on open data and how, it, how it's going. I think it, we're, we're really, um, in things like transport data, increasingly health data, I think the business use has been fantastic. And what, what we're now moving into, though, is a, is a time when we need to do much more to stir the pot. And uh, what we've done is create a, uh, an institution called the Open Data Institute. So rather than us running kind of different app competitions and prizes, which are obviously important, we've created an institution, the Open Data Institute, which is in East London, chaired by Tim Berners-Lee, Nigel Shadbolt. And that is an entity that is there to bring together researchers with startup businesses to play with public data sets, but also private sector data sets. And you know, I'd encourage all of you to look them up, go and drop them an email. You know, they're looking for corporate partners, but they're also looking for you know, friends and allies in the, in the wider tech community. It's a new institution, and it's, it's really wonderful. And I think that's our best bet of truly stimulating the kind of open data economy that, uh, that we'd want to see. OK, thanks. Um, yes, there's the answer to, to man over there, bi-directional APIs. My work here will be done when we do that, so you can quote me on that. Um, happy to talk to you about that later. We'll see more, we'll see sort of um, GovUK content APIs um, already in, in existence, but you'll see more and a richer stream of those later this year and with the transactions. That is a core part of our transactional strategy. If you check out the service standard, the digital by default service standard, you'll see there is a section about APIs, about how we manage them. They're absolutely vital for my money. They're more important than, than sort of websites and web services yeah. to get the IPA, API right. Um, in terms of UC, Kathleen, question asked regularly, but for the benefit of the audience, UC is fine. We're on course for the Pathfinder. We have uh, my colleague David Pitchford, who runs the MPA, has gone in to run that program because after the untimely death of Philip, who is the CIO, so we're helping them work with that whilst we re-recruit back in there. Um, it's on time for both the April and October delivery. Um, but I think you, know, you asked a specific question uh, about, about it. I think the one thing I would say is that it is not an agile program, quite clearly not an agile program, which is a waterfall program. Uh, any program of that type, of that size, that commissions, I'm sorry, procures from such a, 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 a number of vendors in such high amounts of money is clearly by any definition not an agile program. But Apart from that, um, that's it's just fine, and on we go. Okay. Um, I'll take uh, three more questions, and then we'll call it time. So, uh, got three at the front, easy. Paul first, and then the two behind you. Paul Morris from Vodafone. Um, I wonder on, on the Open Data Fund, not least it's actually quite a good, you know, quite a good title for a government invention, which is not always the case. But I use the, the bus data, right, in London, which is brilliant, okay? I would never know, unless I did, you know, unless I do this for a living, 
that that is part powered by that, and you probably should think about that. And why I think that's important is because if I think about, in my job, talking to politicians a lot, they still have a hangover from some fairly bad IT projects of the past. I think there's improvements in play, but the reality is unless we get them on side, actually it is difficult, I think, to show why this is important and all these other things mm -hmm. that we have challenges. And then the final point, I think, is around, and this is quite a tricky one, is, and you're talking about, Mike, about getting the capacity up, which I think is right. But then how do you ensure, given the, you know, basically, you know, are you going to be the most excited place to work? You know, how are you going to ensure you get that swing door working? And I think also become, the civil service to become a sort of driver of change in a way, you know, but then people to go in and out maybe. I don't know how that challenge works. And then how you work well with British, uh, the uh, British ICT industry to sort of get that moving, both large and small. Okay, thank you. And then uh, two people in the row behind. Hello, Stephen Bartholomew from Telefonica Digital. Putting aside the massive challenge of digitalizing government for, for one second, if there was ways in which, you, you spoke about crowd, crowdsourcing, Rohan, if there were ways in which you could use the, the technology and the brain power of the companies represented in this room to solve some public or social challenges, what would be the one or two areas you'd want the industry to, to focus on? Okay, great question, thank you. Question. And then last one. Elizabeth Rose from Trade Shift. In terms of digital evangelists, do you feel that you have enough in situ within central and uh, local government to drive through the initiatives that you're uh, so regularly focused on? Okay, thank you. So a question about um, the uh, relationship between GDS and industry and how do we sort of drive change in government. A um, question about um, if you could get everyone's minds working on a big social or um, policy problem, mm. what would you try and tackle using technology? Um, and have we got enough um, people to evangelise for this agenda across the public sector? So if you guys would like to take those and any passing comments, then... Uh... So first, in terms of um, um, the changes and what, what we do, I think one of the differences, and the clear difference of the way the people work in this new group, is that we do things and then we talk about them. We don't talk about them and then do them. Mm. And I think that is one of the things that people find slightly strange, but it's also it's the approach of people that, that we work with. Actually, as we actually just get it done, the focus is always on delivery rather than saying we're going to go and do it and then having to be held, you know, hoisted by our own petard later on. It's much better to have done it and then talk about it. Um, and for me, the thing that I would like to get more, and more brains around is assisted digital. That would be something where uh, we need a lot of cooperation with people working. But there is a, there is a very strong team in the centre looking at this now. And um, I would say, yeah, in central government, there is, there, Mike will talk a bit about digital leaders, um, which we have in every department. But um, I think in local government, which actually is my heritage, that's somewhere where we need to have um, uh, a different approach. Okay, thanks. Mike? Yeah. Um, we're, we're, yeah. We're short of delivery people and we're short of leadership. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure we need any more evangelists. We've got plenty of them. Um, <laughs> But we, you know, we, we need digital experience and leadership of transformation. You know, I sort of raised sort of my eyebrow at your point about a revolving door. It's been revolving pretty well for the last 15 yeah, right, years. Right, right. It's the wrong way. It's the wrong way. You know, so that's a problem. You know, we can open a door. I mean, the, the lesson I learned early on, and, and the lesson that we all will learn with a generation much younger than I, who, who work in sort of digital, particularly around development, but other areas, is that there's a very strong correlation between them and sort of social activity and creation of public value, you know, they'll do hack days, they'll do stuff out of work, and many people in this room have been involved with that. And we've got, you know, we've got to harness some of that. You know, we, government should be the place, we should open the door to these people, that's what we're doing at GDS, just open the door and say, come in, you won't get paid as much, but you can do some really good stuff. And actually it will have legacy because it's built on open standards, and therefore it will, it will remain after you've gone. And so we've got to keep that door open, you, you're absolutely right. But the way to do that is to actually get them in, and once they're in, allow them to do some work, rather than, <laughs> You know, giving them a desktop they can't use and a browser that doesn't work, you know, because they're not going to hang around. So that's why actually the tooling of the civil service, which is probably the least interesting thing you might want to talk about, is actually vitally important that we get the tools and, and things in place, which when, when this generation come in, because they won't sit around for five minutes if they can't get good stuff done. Okay, right on. Yeah, I mean, on, on, that, on that tooling point, I think, you know, something that you know, I'm proudest of as government is having been able to bring in what well, Tim, Liam and Mike and all the people under them. They, they really are you know, the best in the best in class at this. And um, what what we're standing 
sort of buy to doing number 10 and you know, work, work every day with these guys is to help bring in the best people. And I've also been working with um, Cambridge University who are launching a master's in public policy about having a particular stream of that that takes computer science grads and helps them become more generalist policy officials. So not necessarily for the technology fast stream, but for the sort of main fast stream. So you end up over time with senior policy officials, perm sex, hopefully, with, with strong computer science backgrounds, and uh, rather than you know, classics degrees and, and other, other important things. Um, on, um, on, on, on the point about open data specifically, there was a great moment in, um, I guess it was November 2011, and we were, every, every year since we've got in, we've thrown a party for Silicon Valley Comes to the UK, which is a, a great event that I'm sure lots of you are involved with. And we had a, uh, part of that featured a, an app competition for young university students uh, using government data, and the Prime Minister was meeting the finalists, and he was meeting each of them, and he was, he was saying to them, so what, what does your thing do? And they were saying, you know, it's a, allows you to find out about uh, the nearest bus route or whatever. Really interesting, some of them were really interesting. And he said, and how have you done that? And they explained, they're using government data. And he said, how long did it take you? And typically the answer was kind of um, a weekend or uh, a day or, or whatever. And he was, every time he looked back at me, sort of, and uh, as, as we walked out of the room, he sort of grabbed me and said, wow, it's really happening. And he, uh, that was a moment when I think, you know, it's all credit to him, he had been full-throatedly supportive of the open data agenda even when the benefits to him were, in truth, abstract. And it was those conversations, I think, that, helped, that brought home to him that people were really doing things with this that were really tangible and um, hopefully with real benefit. And, but I think it's through initiatives, as I say, like the Open Data Institute, that the sort of ongoing government role in stirring the pot can, um, can take place. Um, the last thing I'd sort of say is in terms of, there was a question earlier about, and Chris also posted at the beginning, what, what next? My personal little challenge at, at the moment is how can we make government do a better job of using data itself? So we've released all this data out to the world, which is fantastic, and that's the most important thing. But in truth, the way that government itself makes decisions hasn't really changed in the last 20, 30 years for all of the data revolution that we're celebrating. And so one small step in this direction, I, I created a team, led a team that built a data dashboard that is right now on the Prime Minister's iPad. And all this is, is you know, pulling in data from across the public sector, but also outside of government, uh, to give the Prime Minister the best possible, as near as damn real-time information about the performance of public services and key policy initiatives that he particularly cares about or he's particularly focused on. And it, there's nothing particularly, most FTSE 100 CEOs have that. And you know, this is very radical, sadly, for a British Prime Minister. And it's right now being rolled out to other government departments. But I, I would say that mission of actually changing the way Whitehall works on a day-to-day -day basis, <coughs> through what Mike's doing, through what Liam's doing, you know, this is the work, I think, of several governments. And uh, you know, I, I, I just very much hope that you know, however long this government's in power, I know we'll keep pushing on this, but whoever comes next, I think with your help and the help of the civil service, I think this is an agenda that is now going to be part and parcel of government for the next 10, 20, 30 years, and that's exactly the right time frame for this. Okay. Mike, you want to have one more thing? Yes, yeah, just an answer to that guy's question, I really didn't answer it. Um, you asked what you could do, and as a mobile operator, you could join the OIX, which is the Open Ad Ad Identity Exchange, one of the biggest things we're trying to do is federate identity management so that we don't have to build this infrastructure to recognize people, that we can leverage the trust networks they've already got with you. So your Verizon, right? So your Voda. So you're already in, the, in there and, and doing stuff. You know, Telefonica could do that too. Maybe others were in BlackBerry. Because anyone with very large amounts of um, trust in their networks with their customers is something that we want to use. We shouldn't have to, for our 672 transactions, build an identity system for each one of them to ask the users to, to, to identify themselves each time. That's crazy. We should allow users to use the trust network, whether it's with their bank or their phone or the post office or whoever, to identify themselves so that we can transact 
by joining that and by making your work interoperable, you would vastly lower the cost and the inefficiency of government's ability to deliver services, and you would actually be providing a, a, a public good. So go on, because you know you want to. <laughs> okay, thank you. So um, we are up against time, so I'm going to have to draw this to, to a close. Um, I, I have been a civil servant. I had one of those laptops that took um, eight minutes or maybe a little bit longer to boot. Um, when I visit GDS and see some of the things that, that you guys are achieving, it really is um, inspiring. I mean, we've talked about some of the distance to go, but we shouldn't forget how much um, you've achieved. Um, so I hope you have all um, enjoyed the session today, found it interesting. Um, please do look out for future events on Policy Exchange. We've got something in the diary for um, a discussion on cybersecurity. In April, we'll have more events on digital government over the coming months. Um, please do visit our website and fill in the call for evidence if you haven't done that already. Um, but for now, thank you all very much for coming and uh, please join me in thanking the panel.